Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Welcome. It's good to have you all here. Uh, several announcements that I was asked to make uh, that aren't in the directory are in the directory in the bulletin. Pictures for the directory will be up front here immediately after the service. Just look for Lois. She'll be taking those pictures. So if you want to update yours or if you don't have one, see her. Um, and Emily, you had a little announcement you wanted to make about a book or a prayer or something that you're doing? Yes, more than anything else, I always ask, first of all, would you pray for me? Because I don't know exactly how to pray or what to ask for. So last week when I was in the prayer room praying for our service and everyone here, I said, Lord, how can I encourage people to pray? And he said, get the resources. This week, I bought my why, when I don't know what to pray, please, I'm going to put it in the prayer room, and I encourage you to go in and let God meet you and help you know exactly how to have a conversation with him if you want to. Well, thank you. And in times like these, I'm here to tell you that uh, the more people you gather together and the more you unite yourselves in prayer, the stronger I think your prayer will be. So do not hesitate to call your friends, call your buddies, um, meet here if you want. Call me, I'll meet with you, and we'll have a little prayer together, and we'll see what we can do. We'll put our appeal before God and ask for his guidance, direction, strength, courage, wisdom, grace, all those things. Okay? The um, people who do the prayer pal card section Donna, you wanted them here for the Saturday meeting or to see you, one or the other. Is that right? Well, if, they, if they would like to come to the prayer pal breakfast to sign up if they're not a prayer pal in a prayer pal group already. And if they're not able to come that day but are interested, they can call me or see me and let me know and I'll put the name in. Okay, so if you want to sign up, either come to the thing Saturday or see you either way. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is the week of Thanksgiving coming. Traditionally, this church does not have the Wednesday night study the day before Thanksgiving, so we will not be meeting this Wednesday so that everybody has time to prepare or drive or whatever in celebration of Thanksgiving. And the tables out here that we've been doing the Veterans and Athletes United items on they need to be cleared this week. So I don't know what the arrangements are for the uh, silent auction things when you write your check and take your item, if that's upon us or if they're still it's open today. for bids. Today. Close time after church, yeah. Now, take your item today, write your check for it, drop it in the box, and away we go. Okay? Wednesday night, December 1st, choir practice and following that choir practice, Jim and Teresa White will be telling us about their mission work. And if you've not heard the Whites explain what they do, you probably would be um, well informed if you attend. That's one thing about this church. We have a personal relationship with each and every one of our missionaries. So if you want to keep up with them, swing on by on the first and, and we'll be doing that. We've already talked about the Prayer Pal uh, Christmas brunch. And the 15th of December will be the, the Christmas party. Uh, that's a, a big pitch in with a couple of special visitors for kids, grandkids, neighborhood kids. You know, it's a real good time. It's an excellent attended event, and you'll have a great time of fellowship in that. There it is, Tuesday, November the 30th, 6 o'clock, we're going to meet here to decorate the building. Many hands make light work. Uh, there's enough to do for a lot of people. We'll get it done, but if you want time of fellowship to know everybody, come on by. Join us. Help us out with that. Okay? 
And we've got the cantata coming up on the 19th of December. Any other announcements that I might have missed? I have two. Go ahead. Mike Burns. Yeah, I was going to get that in prayer time. Okay, I just say those two, we printed the bulletin before these things happened. Okay. Uh, may as well cover it now. Those of you who have not heard, Mike Burns <coughs> passed away very suddenly. Uh, we have no notice of the arrangements yet, where the visitation will be or where, when the service is. As soon as we get that, we will get it out to you on email. And you want to be in prayer for the Stoner family. They've had a, a loss. And I don't know the details of that arrangement yet. I understand it's 10 or 10.30 on Tuesday, but I don't 10, know where. 10, 10 o'clock on Tuesday? And where will it be? Uh, the name's escaping me right now. It's in Muncie. Okay. If you'll let me know, I'll get it out to the church body. Uh, no, it's the other one. Okay. It's all right. I, we understand. You, you give me the information. I'll get it out to everybody, and, and we'll be in prayer for you. Okay. Any other announcements before we go to birthdays and anniversaries? Okay. Then what about birthdays? Any birthdays this week? Not seeing any. Anniversaries. Any anniversaries? Okay. You've heard a couple of additions to the prayer request list. Uh, in addition to that, okay, you're having some medical issues. Is that right? We can be in prayer for those. Um, my knee is doing well enough. I want to take the opportunity to say thank you, and I'll be sending a, an email to Margaret asking to be taken off the list because I'm doing that well. Thank you so much for all the prayers. You've heard me say it, and if you ever want proof, come see me, and I'll give you the article that proves that prayer works in a, in a scientific study. Um, the rest of them are on here that I can see they are all important. They are all extremely important. Please continue to pray. And if you would now join me in a moment of silent prayer and the ringing of the bell. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Our praise hymn today is number 585, Count Your Blessings. We're going to be standing, if able, on, uh, while we sing all four verses of number 585. today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Our prayer hymn today is number 637, We Gather Together. We're going to be singing all three verses, standing on the third of number 637.
Father God, as we gather together this morning, we come with hearts that are so mixed. We come with hearts of thanksgiving, the joy of life and love and family and friends. But we also come with hearts of pain, for some of our family and friends are suffering dearly. Some, we don't know if they're going to continue in this life or not. And some have already left us. And Father, we human beings have a hard time balancing a sense of joy and a sense of thanksgiving with a sense of pain and loss. But we know that you and you alone can give us the confidence, the courage, the strength to continue on the path that you've set us. Your Holy Spirit is going to encumber us, is going to love us, is going to increase our knowledge and our abilities to serve you to the fullest. As we gather together, Father, permit that Holy Spirit to be in our presence. Let us feel the warmth and the love the joy of being a part of your family. We know how much you love each and every one of your children, and we know that it will be thy will be done. Continue to love us, forgive us, encourage us, and we give you praise in Jesus' name, both now and forever. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion, we'll be singing number 28, To God Be the Glory. We'll sing all three verses standing on the third of number 28.
Praise the Lord. Father, we're so happy to be in your house this today. We come here in unified unity as a family. We come to this table to celebrate one of the greatest gifts any one of us could ever receive. For through the sacrifice of your son, you gave us each an opportunity to be with you for eternity. This time, Lord, we, we ask a blessing on that loaf that represents that body that was beaten, flogged, and then hung on the cross. And we'd ask all this in your son's name. As we continue in our prayer, Father, we do come here with a joy in our heart that you loved us so much that you did this, that you gave your son for our sins. And as Larry prayed just moments ago, with such weight on our hearts, because that was necessary because of our sinful nature. I'm sorry for what I've done. Even the things I haven't yet identified, as soon as I can identify them, I will repent. I'm sure many people here feel the same way, Lord, because we're here because we love you. You loved us. You've made this sacrifice. We accept. We'll do our best. We ask your blessing on the cup that represents that blood that was shed for our sins. And we ask that you bless it to us, that we might share it with others and bring them to you so they can feel the same deep joy we do. And all these things we say in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we give thanks for the many gifts and blessings that you have bestowed upon us, please bless the portion that we return that it may be used for the furtherance of your work. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. I know you were all listening when Brett read the scripture this morning, but I'd like to reemphasize, be joyful always. Now that's pretty difficult to do when things are not going well. If you just lost your job, you have a loved one who is ill, you've just lost to the Lord a friend, you're going to be home alone at Thanksgiving. I could go on and on. It's hard to be joyful all the time. And yet that's what he's saying. He's saying be joyful, not just for the moment. Be joyful for all the experiences you've had in your past. If things are not going well for you today, concentrate on things that did go well in the past. For some of us, we want to concentrate on what might happen in the future. But be joyful. It's difficult. But that's what he encourages. 
He says, pray continually. Not just now and then, off and again, off again. Pray continually. Be always in an attitude of communication with the Lord. Give thanks in all circumstances. Boy, that's difficult when things are tough. I've used the illustration several times, but uh, there was a day in which Margaret and I would, after worship service, would go to a neighbor farmer's and get our eggs. And it was very dark barn lot, barn lot, and I'd park my car, and I'd always leave my lights on so I could see to walk in. It was winter, very cold. I came back out. I had two dozen eggs in a container. I hit a patch of ice. Up went the eggs. Down went Larry. And everything is just scattered all around. And I'm laying there, and it's completely knocked my breath out. And underneath the lights, I can see Margaret laughing. And I can't breathe. And I'm going, uh, 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 trying to help her. And finally she gets out and understands. And I kind of guide her. And all she had to do was put her hands underneath me, lift me up a little bit. Breath came back. It's hard to say thank you, Lord, for that fall. It's hard to say thank you, Lord, for those eggs being all over the barn lot. And yet he says, give thanks in everything. And I've given thanks for that thing a hundred times. Because it reminds me, every time I think of it, it reminds me of how wonderful it is to be able to breathe. Because normally I breathe and don't praise God for it. One of the things you've heard me say so many times is, did you wake up this morning with a toothache? And if you didn't, did you praise God that you didn't have a toothache? Most of us don't. Because we just assume we're not going to have a toothache. And because we assume that, we don't give him praise when we don't have pain. When we have pain, we understand it. When we're lacking pain, we rarely give him the praise that he needs. I read not too long ago about a gentleman who called his son. Now, the man lived in Phoenix, Arizona. He called his son in New York City. And he said, son, I know it's only two days before Thanksgiving, and I hate to ruin it, but I'm going to tell you right now. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. It's been 45 years and we just can't stand each other anymore. Now, I haven't told your sister because you know how bossy she is. So it's up to you to tell her. And he hung up. And the brother called the sister and the sister said, no, they're not. And she called dad and said, don't you do a thing till I get there. I'm calling my brother and we're going to be there tomorrow. He hangs up the phone and said, honey, it worked. The kids are going to be home for Thanksgiving and they're paying for their own airfare. <laughs> Thanksgiving. It's a wonderful time when all's going well. It's a little hard, harder to deal with when things aren't going as well as you wish. But we all have reason to be thankful. If your family's coming and you don't have to trick them and you don't have to bribe them, be thankful. Be thankful. How wonderful it is when the family gets together. Now we have our, our youngest daughter is not going to be with us for Thanksgiving. And of course, Margaret and I may not be totally together because Margaret is not going to be able to attend our Thanksgiving family gathering. But our youngest daughter is with one of her best friends who lost a child. And they're out in Utah gathering together. She's best friends from California. They live in St. Louis and they're coming together in Utah. And, and you know, I'm thrilled to death. I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm, I'm just thankful that she cares enough about friendship that she would rather spend her time with that woman helping her and her husband deal with their grief than they would be back home. I'm going to miss them. The whole family will miss them. But we know it's kind of a mission. To reach out to somebody who's in pain is a mission, and that's where, what we're all about. Jesus is constantly encouraging us to reach out and help those who are in need. So today I'm going to say, and if you looked at the, the bulletin, and for the title, I, I don't know, I just entitled it, When You Go to Bed Tonight. When you go to bed tonight, I'm going to ask you to do things. I'm going to ask you to be joyful 
and I'm going to ask you to be thankful. And even in your pain, I'm going to ask you to be joyful and thankful. Joyful for what you've experienced and thankful that you have a God who loves you and cares about you and is going to be there for you. Scripture said in verse 16, be joyful always. Always. You know, and that's kind of hard to do. And sometimes we human beings just don't understand how fortunate we are. We really don't. And especially in this country. We just take for granted. Read a story about two men who met, hadn't met each other for quite some time. The one of them looked very glum. He was really down. The other friend said, what's, what, what's wrong with your life? He said, well, let me tell you. He said, three weeks ago, my uncle died and he left me $40,000. Man, said, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Two weeks ago, I had an uncle who died, and I didn't even know him, and he left me $5,000. The man said, well, you're really blessed. And then last week, he said, I had an aunt died, and she left me $12,000. And he said, why are you looking so glum? He said, this week, nothing We Americans are so used to being blessed when there's not a special blessing in our life, we feel like we got gypped. We ought to be so thankful, so thankful that we were born in this country, so thankful that we have this opportunity to make a difference. You know, we'd like to think we'd never be that way. We're always thankful, but we also know that there are times when we have all these blessings we just take for granted. We forget to pause and say, thank you, Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? What the scripture is simply saying, everything you have is a gift from God. He gave you the time and the talent and the resources to make your life whatever it is. He's given you ability. He's given you a chance to to have a job to earn or just to be a great mother or a great father or, or whatever it is. And boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing better in the world than being a grandpa. Well, yeah, being a grandma is pretty good too. We are so blessed. Even in our pain, we are blessed. One of the things that I'll never forget, my my partner, Jack Terry, and most of you have heard enough about him, you kind of know you know him if you've never met him. But when Jack first went to Jamaica, he had an opportunity to have dinner with an English couple who was living in Jamaica. And they were very poor, and they were really struggling. And the man went out into the bay and caught a couple of fish, and she fixed it for for dinner that night. And if you know Jack, he's very, very polite and and loving and caring. And at the end of the meal, he thanked her and thanked her and thanked her. So that was such a wonderful meal. I appreciate it so much. It was so good. And she she kind of blushed. She said, thank you. He said, my husband, he never thanks me for a meal. And Jack was kind of embarrassed for the husband because he'd made such a big deal out of it and the husband never did. And the husband, as best I can remember, the husband said something like, well, hey, love, I would have told you if I didn't like it. (laughs) See how negative we can be? Apparently, meal after meal after meal, he had never said anything. Now, I'm not... I'm not very good at a lot of things, but one thing I do do is I do thank Margaret for every meal because, as you all know, I'm the world's worst cook. So I am blessed with every meal, and I try to make sure she knows it. All I'm trying to say is there's a lot in our life to be thankful for, and, and we just have to understand how joyful life can be. I read a story one time about a, a young man who just had finished his CPA licensure passed his tests, went back home. Now, his father was an immigrant. Come over to this country, he had nothing but the clothes on his back. That was it. He had a little store. 
And the son started looking at his books and he said, Dad, you don't even know whether you're making a profit or not. He said, you don't, you don't keep good books at all. And the man looked at him and said, Son, I came here with nothing but the clothes on my back. Your brother is now a doctor. Your sister is an art teacher. And you are a CPA. Your mom and I have a little house. And I have a car. And I have this business. Now you add all that up, subtract the clothes on my back, and all the rest is profit. Think about that. All the rest is profit. Our lives rearing our children, that's profit. Our lives living together, that's profit. It doesn't have to be in the billfold. It doesn't have to be in the bank. Profit can be the experiences you have as you live your life. Be joyful that you have the opportunity of living life. And always, always, always look back occasionally at those good times and let those elevate your thoughts. You know, I know, you know that there, there are people in this room right now who are struggling. And some of you have told me that you're struggling. You're struggling because of your wife. You're struggling because of your daughter. You're struggling because of the loss of your mother-in-law. You're struggling because of your son. You're struggling because, you know, the struggle's there. But joy is too. Joy because you have a Savior who loves you so much, who will never leave you, who will always be there for you. You can always count on it. Let that joy be a part of your life. And then the scripture that Brett read to you goes on to say, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will for you. God wants you to be excited about having a Savior who loves you. He wants you to be thankful for that. You know, I, I like the story about the lady who was driving up to a bank and she was going into the, the drive through and she'd never been to this bank before. Now, the sun was shining quite bright, and the bank teller had pulled down the curtain, which made it look like just a solid metal piece. And she goes up, she puts her things in, she gets it back, and so forth. And she, she looked at it, and she said, you know, I know you're probably just an automated machine, but I feel like I ought to say thank you anyway. I feel like I ought to say thank you anyway. And I'm saying, amen, sister. You know, Amen. We ought to be thankful for even the littlest things that happen in life. There are so many that happen, and we just take them for granted, and we don't do anything about it. We should be thankful for all the people that we have in our lives. You know, I, I read an article. It was called Arnold's Toys, and it was about Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it said he was worth a mere $800 million dollars. 800 million. That he has just a, a nice little $18 million jet, a $4.5 million boat. That he has nine Hummers, all worth about $100,000 apiece. He wears $5,000 suits, $3,000 pairs of shoes and smokes $4,000 cigar. Now I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in your chair, Mark, and I'm thinking, a cigar would pay for our whole mission project in Jamaica. One cigar a month would pay for that. And I'm asking myself, how could, if I, if I had that, how could I go to sleep at night, knowing I was smoking a $4,000 cigar, and I've got people hungry, all over this country and all over the world. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, most of us would probably be jealous. He's got that beautiful jet, he's got that great big yacht, and he's got all these Hummers and how, you know, and I suddenly found out he ought to be jealous of us. Because we're rich. He's only got money. We are rich. 
We have a mansion in heaven promised for us. We are wealthy. We have friends. We have neighbors. We have a, a Lord that loves us and died for us. And we are rich. And I feel sorry for people who only have money and are not rich. I know I, I, I pick on people and I shouldn't, I'm sure. But when I pick on me or when I talk about me, I can't get anybody else in trouble. But most of you know that, or some of you know, that when I was 11 years old, I borrowed some money and I bought 500 chickens. And those little old gals in about eight months were really laying like crazy. And my father, I lived with my mother and my fourth stepfather at the time. And my, my father lived in a GI development, and this was 1946 and 47, and these guys had just gotten back from the war. And fresh country eggs were absolutely just loved. And I had a red wagon, and a 60 dozen cart fit right in that wagon, and I'd go up and down, ring a bell, and they'd come out, and I was making somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 bucks every two weeks. Now, that's a lot of money back then. You know, my parents were probably making maybe 40 a week, you know. And I was wealthy. And I used that money. I bought a horse, beautiful buckskin horse. I had a saddle and bridle. I had a rifle. I had a motor scooter. I had a black leather jacket. I'm 12 years old by now, and I am rich. And I am miserable. Because my mother's going through the fifth divorce. And I'm going to have to move off the farm and sell my horse and get rid of my motor scooter. See, I had everything a kid could ever want except security. And when you don't have that, you don't have much. I know what it's like to be rich, really rich with monetary things for a kid. Never been that way as an adult, but for a kid, I had it all. And I understand what it's like to lose it. And let me tell you, you know, I started my ministry in 1961, and I was always interested in missions. My first congregation down in Rosedale, when I went there, had a zero budget for missions. Not one dime ever went to mission. When I left there, we had a budget of $500. Now, you can say $500. That, hey, when you go from zero to anything, when you move aboard from zero to anything, you feel good. But when I, you know, my second church and my third church, but when I came to Cumberland, when I came back here to Fishers, missions really became an important part of my life. But nothing really moved it so much as my first experience. In 1980, I had done some extra work for Avon School Corporation, and beyond my regular salary, I got this bonus. And Margaret and I decided to use it to go on a cruise, and we went to the Bahamas. And we got off the ship and, and we got back on. We're looking at this and we're looking and all these kids are shinning up the chain, anchor chain, and getting on the deck. And people are on the deck throwing quarters into the water and they're diving off three stories to get these quarters in the water. Back then there was no, no security on the docks. Anybody could walk right up, you know. And here... They were bringing out these great big containers of leftover foods and garbage. And here were these women bags. And I mean, it must have been 50 of them or more. And I'm talking to one of the women because they're, they're going in there and they're getting this stuff out and putting in their bags. And I said, are you getting this for your dogs? Oh, no, man. I'm going to feed my family. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, you are going to feed your family out of the garbage that we threw away on the ship. Yeah. Now, this is all, you know, hitting my, my, high, my mind and my heart, and I, I've never seen anything quite like this. And then as we're walking up the dock, and, and we're almost to the ship, here's a little boy about nine years old. And he said, I sing you a song for a quarter. And I reached in my pocket, and all I had was 15 cents. And I said, this is all I've got. And he sang, shrimp boats are coming for me. For 15 cents. From that moment on, missions had always meant so much to me. So very much. When I went to Russia, I could not believe. 
You know, I have spent my whole life being afraid of the Russians, thinking the Russian people were the bad people. You get over there and you find out they're just like you and me. A Russian man just wants to take care of his family, just wants to have a little home, you know, something. I'm working with Russian administrators. All school principals are higher. And I'm teaching them about Jesus. They're going to implement a, an elective course in the public schools on the life of Christ. And I'm over there teaching them about Jesus so they will know how to deal with parents if there's a concern about teaching this new course, the Bible. Not one of them had an automobile. I'm in a city called Izhevsk. It's up in the capital of the Emerging Republic, which is up in Siberia. And there, it's about the city of Indianapolis, size of Indianapolis, and there are three restaurants in the whole town. Three. I'm going to take these people out. They've been with me all week long. They really worked hard. They're praising the Lord. Things are really going good. I think we ought to take them to a restaurant. And I send my interpreter out to find out how much it would be. Comes back in. A single meal in that restaurant would be one week of their work. And we decided that would be embarrassing if I took them. That would be flaunting. So we ended up having a pitch-in. A pitch-in in a little old lady's house. She was in her 70s. She lived in the ninth floor of a flat apartment building. No elevator. And no lights because people would steal the lights in the hallway. And so you, you ever know what it's like to walk up nine floors? Nine, and Russian steps aren't even. You know, here in America, you kind of close your eyes and you go, you know, not there. Every step was a little bit different and you had to kind of feel your way along. And I sat there and I said, I've been afraid of this all my life. How ridiculous. And then many of you know, I've told you before, in my second trip, we went to Belarus. And there, my interpreter took me to a children's hospital where the children there primarily were all there with all kinds of weird mutations on their bodies because of the, the acid that had come from the meltdown of Chernobyl and it had gone all over the country. I've never felt so sick in my life for these children and for these parents. And I'm, I'm going home saying, I wish every American could experience this. I wish everyone could feel what I'm feeling. And then sadly enough, you know, we, spent, we spent three days debriefing us when we came back home because they said, you know, nobody in America is going to understand and nobody going to, you know, they're all going to say, how was your trip? And they only want a two-minute version and you want to give them a, a three-day version. And poor Mark, we, we got home and that first night we went to Newcastle to celebrate our son's birthday and went into a Ponderosa and she started complaining about her steak. And it just, you know. I was afraid to eat meat there because I thought it was dog. And she's complaining about a steak. That's, that's, that's the difference between us and the world out there. All I'm telling you is, I want you to go to bed tonight and be joyful for what you have and to be thankful. And God is with you. God loves you. Even in your darkest hour, he's there and always will be. I don't know how to tell it any other way, but we in this congregation have a chance and have had a chance to make a difference in the world. The 11 missions that we support are vital. When you go to bed tonight, be thankful that you have a chance to make a difference. That this world is different because you have been born. This world is different because you have been alive. This world is different because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And this world is going to be different because you're going to make it different. Your prayer life, your commitment, it brings joy. And one of the things that I've always found is a joyful person 
is normally a thankful person. And a thankful person is always a joyful person. When you go to bed tonight, be joyful, be thankful. Amen. As we gather together, we always offer an invitation. I never know when there's someone who is really hurting beyond just the norm. Someone who wants to repent and someone who wants to rededicate their life. I never know when there's someone who just wants to be a part of this family as we gather together. And I never know when there's someone who's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we offer the invitation, always. If that affects anyone's life, we invite you to come. Our hymn of invitation is number 636. Come, ye thankful people, come. If you're able, will you stand? Outside this congregation, and we pray for safe travel for those who are traveling to be with their family and friends. So just now, Lord, we thank you for the blessings of this world, and we ask all this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Will you gather in our circle? And I want to remind you at the end of the service if you have a bid out there or you have something you want to take home with you, please gather today. This is our last day.